you've learned a lot about confidence, everything ranging from the architecture of a confinet to how to use it for image recognition to object detection to face recognition and neural style transfer. And even though most of our discussion has focused on images, on sort of 2D data, because images are so pervasive, it turns out that many of the ideas you've learned about also apply not just to 2D images, but also to 1D data as well as to 3D data. Let's take a look. In the first week of this course, you learned about the 2D convolution, where you might input a 14 by 14 image and convolve that with a 5 by 5 filter. And you saw how 14 by 14 convolved with 5 by 5, this gives you a 10 by 10 output. Um, and if you had multiple channels, maybe those 14 by 14 by 3, then it would be 5 by 5 that matches the same 3. And then if you have multiple filters, say 16 filters, you end up with 10 by 10 by 16. It turns out that a similar idea can be applied to 1D data as well. For example, on the left is an EKG signal, uh, also called an electrocardiogram. It's basically if you place an electrode over your chest, this measures the little voltages that vary across your chest as your heart beats, because uh, the little electric waves generated by your heart beating can be measured with a pair of electrodes. And so this is an EKG of someone's heart beating. And so each of these uh, peaks corresponds to one heartbeat. So if you want to use EKG signals to make medical diagnoses, for example, then you would have 1D data, because what EKG data has is, is basically a time series showing the voltage at each instant in time. So rather than a 14 by 14 dimensional input, maybe you just have a 14 dimensional input. And in that case, you might want to convolve this with a one-dimensional filter. So rather than the 5x5, five five, you just have a five-dimensional filter. So with 2D data, what the convolution allowed you to do was to take the same 5x5 five five feature detector and apply it at lots of different positions um, throughout the image. And that's how you wound up with your 10x10 10 10 output. What a 1D filter allows you to do is take your five-dimensional filter and similarly apply that at lots of different positions throughout this 1D signal. And so if you apply this convolution, what you find is that a 14-dimensional thing convolved with this 5-dimensional thing, this will give you a 10-dimensional output. And again, if you have multiple channels, you might have a 14 by, in this case, an EKG is just one channel. If you have a one lead or one electrode for EKG, so times five by one. And if you have 16 filters, maybe you end up with um, 10 by 16 over there. And this could be one layer of your confinet. And then for the next layer of your confinet, if you input a 10 by 16 dimensional input, and you might convolve that with a five dimensional filter again, then this needs to um, have 16 channels, so that has to match. And if you have 32 filters, then the output after another layer would be 6 by 32, if you have um, 32 filters. Right? And the analogy to the 2D data is this is similar to how if you have 10 by 10 by 16 data, and you convolve it with a 5 by 5 um, by 16, and that has to match, that will give you a 6 by 6 dimensional output. And uh, if you have 32 filters, that's where the 32 comes from. So all of these ideas apply also to 1D data, where you can have the same feature detector, such as this, applied to a variety of positions. For example, to detect the different heartbeats in an EKG signal, but to use the same set of features to detect the heartbeats even at different positions along these time series. And so confidence can be used even on 1D data. For a lot of 1D data applications, you actually use a recurrent neural network, which you learn about in the next course, but some people also can try using confidence in these problems. Um, and in the next course on sequence models, which we'll talk about recurrent neural networks and LCM and other models like that, we'll talk about the pros and cons of using 1D confidence versus some of those other models that are explicitly designed for sequence data. So that's the generalization from 
2D to 1D. How about 3D data? Well, what is three-dimensional data? It is that instead of having a 1D list of numbers or a 2D matrix of numbers, you now have a 3D block, a three-dimensional input volume of numbers. So here's an example of that, which is if you take a CT scan, uh, this is a type of X-ray scan that gives a three-dimensional model of your body. But what a CT scan does is it takes different slices through your body. So as you scan through a CT scan, which I'm doing here, you can look at different slices of the human torso to see how they look. And so this data is fundamentally three-dimensional. And one way to think of this data is if your data now has some height, some width, and then also some depth, where this is where the different slices through this volume are the different slices through the torso. So if you want to apply a confinet to detect features in this three-dimensional CAT scan or CT scan, then you can generalize the ideas from the uh, first line to three-dimensional convolutions as well. So if you have a 3D volume, and for the sake of simplicity, let's say it's um, 14 by 14 by 14, um, and so this is the height, width, and depth of the input CT scan. And again, just like images don't all have to be square, a 3D volume doesn't have to be a perfect cube as well. So the height and width of an image can be different, and in the same way, the height and width and the depth of a CT scan can be different, but I'm just using 14 by 14 by 14 here to simplify the discussion. And if you convolve this with a now a 5x5x5 five by five by five filter, so your filters now are also three-dimensional, then this will give you a 10x10x10 10 by 10 by 10 volume. And technically, uh, you could also have by one if this is the number of channels. So this is just a 3D volume, but your data can also have different numbers of channels. Then this would be um, times one as well, because the number of channels here and the number of channels here has to match. Then, uh, and if you have 16 filters that are 5 by 5 by 5 by 1, then the next outputs will be 10 by 10 by 10 by 16. And then if, so this could be one layer of your confinet over 3D data. And if um, the next layer of the confinet convolves this again with a 5 by 5 by 5 by 16 dimensional filter, so this number of channels has to match that as usual. And if you have 32 filters, then similar to what you saw with confident over images, now you end up with a 6 by 6 by 6 volume um, across 32 channels. So 3D data can also be learned on sort of directly using a three-dimensional confident. And what these filters do is really detect features across your 3D data. CAT scans, medical scans is one example of 3D volumes but another example of data you could treat as a 3D volume would be movie data, where the different slices could be different slices in time through a movie. And you could use this to detect motion or people taking actions in movies. So that's it on generalization of confidence from 2D data to also 1D as well as 3D data. Image data is so pervasive that the vast majority of confidence are on 2D data, on image data, but I hope that these other models will be helpful to you as well. So this is it. This is the last video of this week and the last video of this course on confidence. You've learned a lot about confidence and uh, I hope you find many of these ideas useful for your future work. So congratulations on finishing these videos. I hope you enjoyed this week's pro exercise and I look forward also to seeing you in the next course on sequence models.